Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. This episode of Everyone Loves Guitar is brought to you by Taylor Guitars and their new Grand Pacific Round Shoulder Dreadnought. Powered by Taylor's Breakthrough V-Class Bracing System, the Grand Pacific gives you a warm season sound with clear low-end power and notes that are stronger, longer sustaining, and more in tune with each other all the way up the fretboard. Make sure you check it out online at taylorguitars.com, then go out and play one today. That's the new Grand Pacific at taylorguitars.com. Did you know if your instrument or any of your gear is damaged, broken, or stolen outside your home, your homeowner's insurance policy will not cover any of it? That's right. Homeowner's insurance only pays if something happens inside your home. But Music Pro Insurance insures all your music gear, no matter where it is, anywhere in the world, even when you check it in as baggage on an airline. Here, let me give you some examples. Let's say you're in a car accident and your equipment is damaged, you're covered. Your kid pours apple juice into your amplifier, covered. Someone spills beer all over your pedal board at a gig somewhere across the world, boom, you're covered. Any kind of theft or accidental damage is covered, even water damage from hurricanes and breakage from earthquakes. But here's what makes Music Pro really different. They're not going to argue with you over the value of your instrument or make you run around looking for receipts when it comes time to paying your claim. They know exactly why your vintage instrument is worth 10 times more than a new one. Plus, all claims are typically paid and fully settled in 24 to 48 hours. So if your equipment is not insured properly, go to musicproinsurance.com, hit standard, then enter your information and get a free gear protection estimate. Don't be that player who ignores this, and then next month when something happens, you're wondering why you didn't take 10 minutes to do this properly. Make sure you go to musicproinsurance.com, enter your information, and get a free gear protection estimate. If something happens, you will be thanking me. Trust me on this, musicproinsurance.com. The Be Fulfilled Journal helps you be more honest with yourself and with others and be more open to handling things you've avoided dealing with for years. It's a 12-week online and journal program that helps you identify and eliminate things you do that are causing you stress and live in more gratitude and joy. It was actually developed by a long-term friend of mine who got sober in 2008, and he's put together a great deal just for my listeners. You get the 300-page hardcover journal and access to the 12-week video program online, plus free shipping, plus membership in a private Facebook support group with others going through the program, plus a five-day mini course showing you how to let go of stuff that's draining your energy, plus a 30-day 100% money-back guarantee. To start your journey and get all the bonuses, go to BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. That's BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. For more information on advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. That's EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Got a very cool... Very cool guy and a great guitar player with I mean, like a really great guitar player with us. We're with the one and only Mark Goldenberg. And uh, before we get rolling, I just want to say thank you to Eric Sky, our mutual friend, for hooking us up. Eric hooked us up, right? He did, indeed. Thank you, Eric. Um, Mark's – I'm going to have to turn you on to this guy if you don't know him. Mark's a guitarist and composer. He's played on records for tons of artists, including Jackson Brown, Bonnie Raitt, Linda Ronstadt, Eels, Natalie Imbruglia, Chris Isaac, Ringo Starr, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, Peter Frampton, Manolo Garcia, Joan Baez, and hold on to your seats, William Shatner. Uh, he's played lead guitar for Jackson Brown from 94 to 2010 and from 2012 to 14 he toured with acclaimed pianist and actor Hugh Laurie in 2016 he played with uh, Spanish superstar Manolo Garcia he's also a songwriter and producer whose works have been recorded by Linda Ronstadt Chicago the Pointer Sisters Natalie and Bruglia Eels Chris Body and Olivia Newton-John amongst others wow what the diversity to play with all those guys 
and to write for all that's really impressive man um during the 1980s mark released four albums of instrumental music in japan his first self-titled cd of guitar solo guitar music was released in 2004 in 2015 mark and the very same eric sky released a recording of duo music called artifact Mark, along with noted drummer Jay Bellarose and bassist Jennifer Condos, released Trio, which is a collection of instrumental pieces. He will be doing a show at the Argenta Acoustic Music Series in Little Rock, Arkansas, on April 18th, and he'll be appearing at the La Conner Guitar Festival between May 10th and 12th in beautiful downtown La Conner, Washington. And um, if you want to see just an incredible live solo Take, grab your pen and a pad right now and write this down. I want you to go to YouTube and search for Jackson Brown. That's Brown with an E. And you want to look at the video, Doctor My Eyes from the Glastonbury Festival in 2010. Dude, I watched that. I was like, I don't know how anybody could play guitar after seeing that, man. I was just blown away. And you did that. No, seriously, man. I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. That was just amazing man it was you know really cool well, i'm glad you liked it i <laughs> thought it was really long yeah it was great more guitar more guitar exactly more guitar i was like dude i watched it i could watch it a couple times and i was like dude shut up after about like bar 32 i was like all right <laughs> but i went on anyway so it was fun oh it was great man was that like what's that it was ex- really hot that day it looked pretty hot man it's really hot and we were actually just watching people faint from oh. the stage and we we're looking out at the audience and all of a sudden we just see someone go boop, go on hey what happened to that guy you know boop, boop, boop. it was it was extremely hot especially for you know, being in england in the summer yeah but it was nice it was a great tour was that like that every night? Like you do a ripping long so even i'll tell you what was really you know it was the nice thing about it was watching jackson watch you and he was like holy fuck this you know the expression on his face which you don't get to see that really often that was really cool um yeah that was kind of a set piece for that show so we would uh, we would always that was kind of the show closer so that was you know they get gave they gave me a pretty long uh, leash for solo on man well you 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 did a great job again man so that was cool um all right so I did a little research. You were on American Bandstand in 1980. So for anybody that's under what? Probably like age 40. Just ignore this question. Um, (laughs) What was that all about, man? That's pretty cool. In 1978, I started a band called Cretones. um, And we were kind of a, a, a new wave pop skinny tie band. Uh, along the lines of the knack, but not that good. And we uh, we had we got lucky because we, uh, Linda Ronstadt recorded a few of my songs for her Mad Love album of that in 1980, I think 79, 80. And so we our little band got uh, a little a boost, a boost in uh, publicity and notoriety. So we got to uh, make a record. Uh, for Richard Perry's Planet Records, and uh, we did some touring, and then we also got to be on American Bandstand. That must have been really cool, no? It's really cool. I'm, I I can't remember exactly, but I might have been wearing a navy jacket on that game. <laughs> I do remember that I was really nervous, and then I broke a string. Of course, it was a lip sync, so it didn't really matter that I broke a string. But uh, uh, Dick Clark, who was the host, came up to me and asked me, what do I do when I break a string on stage? And I had no answer. I was like, I'm, 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 I was really like humming, humming, humming. And it was really kind of a, an embarrassing moment because I'm not, you know, you, I'm usually pretty verbose, but like that, he kind of just caught me off guard. And the other thing that kind of freaked me out was that when he came over, you know, Dick Clark must have been 180 years old when he passed away because he had he had like three inches of makeup on. And when I got <laughs> to him, I just I kept I look at his face and was like, man. That's deep makeup. <laughs> so, uh, you were wondering what Dick Clark really looks like, huh? You know, I got I, I got to see him up close. He was super nice, so it was really great, and it was great to be on American Bandstand. 
did that like score points like with you know the 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 kids that you know your friends or whatever your peer group uh that's questionable i don't think my peer group really cared but uh it's, it was good to play for the kids yeah that's such a cool thing man all right so you've worked with some very big names obviously in to- in different capacities as a writer and as a player i was curious what was the first you know, large named act you work with, how'd you get the gig and what were you doing right before that? Well, okay. Um, the very, very first act I ever worked with was William Shatner. But that was kind of one, a weird one-off because I was still living in Chicago and I had a manager, I was in a band and I had a manager who knew the piano player for William Shatner and they were doing a record in Chicago of all places of Mr. Shatner reciting poetry over background music, right? Isn't that so, what he, all of his records were, pretty much? I think he really sang, so that's one of his records. This was not the record with Mr. Tambourine Man on it. It was a sec, uh, another record. Uh, well, is it one of the biggest regrets of your career that you did not play on the William Shatner Tambourine Man record? You know, in, in a life full of regrets, that's a, t- that's a big one. Yeah, I... <laughs> I got him and he was super nice, you know. Um, and so they needed they needed somebody to, to play like some pseudo Elizabethan guitar uh, on a track while he would narrate. So I was like, I played, the, my manager knew that I played classical guitar, so that he kind of just got me in there and got me on the gig. But it was like, you know, it was in by nine, out by 1030 kind of situation. It wasn't like, hey, we're going to hang out with Michelle. Oh, no, there was no. It was just like in and out. No, all I, I when the record came out, like his voice looked like a, to you know, imagine an Easter Island <laughs> head, <laughs> poetry, and then imagine like a Barbie doll, three miles away playing guitar with a lot of reverb on. That's kind of how. <laughs> it was. was it? Did he talk to you or anything? That, that had to be that had to be really weird seeing him out of context like that. Yeah, it was like you know, I mean. I don't want to talk out of school, but he had a pretty good toupee. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, he no always. He was, uh, and he was pretty nice. But it was just kind of like it was a first session for me, so I was uh, extraordinarily nervous, and it was brief. And I was just actually glad when it was over. So you got it. Oh, great! And everything one take. Yeah, it was like you know, it was it was really play something that sounds Elizabethan. So it wasn't even like there was no. There was no chart. There was no no direction. There was no music. It was just kind of a quick uh, instant composition. So outside of the fact that it was Shatner, it was probably a great gig for a first session, like pressure wise. Yeah, it was really well. It was intense, and, and it was like I don't think I was truly prepared for it. But I, you know, I was still at that time going to music school. I I didn't know much of any wet behind the ears. So. Very cool, man. Okay, so I want, I want to throw out some names out there and maybe for each one of these artists, if you could talk about how you got the gig and either a, an interesting or cool story or maybe something you learned from the experience. Absolutely. Okay, let's start with Jackson because that was a very long, great gig. Um, I got the gig because we have a mutual friend named Kevin McCormick. Kevin was in Jackson's band. Uh, playing bass. Um, I'd known Kevin in LA for a while before that. And in fact, Kevin had brought me around to Jackson's studio uh, a couple of years before. And um, Kevin had produced a couple of records from Melissa Etheridge. Hmm. And um, Kevin just called me up and asked me if I would want to come down to the, the studio and play on a couple of tracks. They were working on a record called I'm Alive which was kind of a little bit of a comeback record for him. It was a, a return to like less produced processed sounding music and a more natural kind of presentation of his songs. And it was a real, a strong, you know, it was a pretty strong collection of songs. And I went down and played basically solos on two tracks, uh, the song I'm alive. And I played a solo on uh, a song called sky blue and black. And, uh, 
that was really fun. I went down there and actually I had to go back the next day. Well, first I had to go down there and play the some solos, right? And then Jackson sent me out into the to the call to the kitchen to hang out while he comped together a solo of mine. Um, he did that, and I came in and he asked me to, if I could learn the solo and replay it. So I played it about seventeen times. <laughs> then, then we took it and then uh, we went on to the other song. And the same process happened. Uh, and then, like a couple of days later, Jackson called me and he says, "Hey, can you come back and redo these solos again? I think your sound was a little bright." Uh, and at the time I was playing like a Telecaster through a matchless, which were, there was a bright guitar going through a bright amp and I used like a pedal. I also was using a compressor pedal at the time. So it was just like, you know, maybe it might've been a little ice picky. <laughs> I admit it. Uh, then I went back. So I did the solos and then, you know, nothing for a while. And then all of a sudden I got a call, uh, from Jackson asked me if I, or, or Jackson's manager asking me if I wanted to go to Europe for like a short tour. They were going to go to Spain. And, um, I can't remember where else they went. Uh, maybe London. It was, it was a short promotional tour for the new record. But then I kind of like stayed. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't like, hey, you're in the band. You know, I didn't get measured for the matching cardigan or anything like that. But it, was just, you know, it, it just became my gig for a while. And it was really great. Like We did a bunch of everything i did you know i was there for like almost for 15 years so we did videos shoots we did uh you know we did some documentaries we worked on a couple more records with jackson and uh uh it was really great it was a really great experience and it was basically the same core band for the whole experience we'd have you know a couple few people come in and out but it was really like the same people so i got i made some great friends who i still play with every now and then so it was good it's really cool. True. Any interesting yeah. stories? Oh man, I got. Ah, uh, yeah. This is a funny story. Um, one night we were playing uh, one of these outdoor summer sheds, right? And uh, we had dinner at the gig, and. Um, about halfway through this set, I started feeling like my pants were getting really tight. <laughs> and I, I looked down and I was like, I was like puffing up like a blowfish or something. And then all of a sudden I started feeling like there was going to be a problem, like a big problem if I didn't get to the bathroom really soon. Oh my God. And I'm standing on stage and I'm like, this is, you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the set list and I go, oh, we've got three songs to go. Am I going to make it? We finally, I made it to the end of the stint. I, roll, I run, run off screaming, looking for a bathroom. I find a bathroom, and I'm like in there, and it's like, it's like a, it's just, whatever it was, it wanted out, and a lot of it, and it couldn't, <laughs> it wouldn't stop, right? So I, I was in the bathroom, right? And I, right above me was a speaker that was actually playing, you know, it, it had like the sound of the audience. So I was like between the end of the set and the encore, right? Mm. So uh, the next song that was going to happen, the first encore was The Loadout, mm. which is, a, which is a, a song, and it goes into that song, Stay. Yeah. And it was a song that Jackson would do with solo piano, and then I would come in and play a lap steel solo. And I'm sitting there, and I'm going, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. So I keep hearing him. I hear him start playing. I hear the audience roaring and I hear him playing the piano and I hear him playing. And it finally, like I'm sure I'm really trying to get out of there, but it's not happening. Uh, he finally gets up to the point where there's a solo and I hear him pause. Like he goes to where the solo is and he realizes that I'm not there. And, uh, oh there was a big pause and then he just went on playing. He just didn't have any choice. He had to go on. Um, I made it out for the next song. Wow. There. That was, I don't know if that's a great story, but that's a true story. But then again, of course, I became the, uh, you know, they wouldn't let me hear the end of that for quite a while. Yeah, I would imagine yeah. that's one of those things you, yeah, you know, I would imagine. You know, everyone talks about the glamour of touring. <laughs> they never talk about the glamour of catering. Yeah, and that's something. Uh, what, what, what did you learn from, I mean, that's, 
you toured all over the world. What did you learn, or is there anything you learned musically, or like, um, enter- as an entertainer? Um, playing with Jackson was great. He, his fans adore him, and uh, he takes his his job seriously. He's he's out there to play music for his fans. He really he loves what he's doing. And uh, I think if I learned anything in that gig, it was like how committed you need to be to be an artist like that. You know, he doesn't, he gets up in the morning. I mean, actually, he's constantly, he, he listens to, like, we would do the show, he would listen to our recording of the show after the show on the bus. And then we'd have, like, really long sound checks where we would, like, dissect things that we'd done the night before and, we'd, like, really try to, like, carve, carve out new territory for for you know, his material, he wanted his players to play it in the best possible way. And he, you know, was very, very focused on what he wanted to hear. It was great to see, you know, that was like, he was really committed. He was, a, you know, he's a deep guy. So, so it's basically, you learn like the end product of this is extremely deliberate. It's not randomly or just happens to be great. There's a, a ton of effort and measurement and time and precision that goes into this whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. It's not, it's not a random thing. Yeah. He's meticulous. I, I know, think to sound like it's, you've just played it for the first time, whatever it is that you're doing. He yeah. wants it meticulous, but not to sound studied. I think everything that you do is kind of like that, you know, in business, anything, I think, you know, people sometimes have a thing, oh, it just these guys just took off or, you know, fill in the blank. And I don't think that happens. I think everything is like you need a ton of effort to get shit going. Yeah, you, you need to be – you need to have that intention, that yeah. intention to do something. Yeah, very much so. How about Frampton? Wow. Well, that was, a, that was an earlier era. That was a really – actually, I had a lot of fun playing with Peter. We did – an album together. Um, I, I started working with Peter because I had been in the Cretones and had written these songs for my band and also for Linda Ronstadt. And one of the guys that worked with Peter, uh, was a fan. Peter was going through a period, uh, in like, this was kind of like post his, uh, you know, like his big, the the big wave of his Frampton comes alive. Yeah, that was kind of over. And this was like, you know, 82, 83. And, and um, I think he might have been just having a bit, of, a bit of writer's block and he had a record that needed to come out. And uh, because I had some cred as a songwriter and as a musician, as a player, uh, uh, they brought me out and the chemistry was great. Peter was fantastic. And we, we wrote a record together. I don't think it's his favorite. It may be actually his least favorite, but they're, they're you know, that was he was going through that time in his life yeah, for a number of reasons. But we had a great time and I played with him for a couple of years and I toured a lot. And I learned a lot about guitar tone working with Peter Frampton because Peter really is, he knows how to get a great guitar sound. And I, yeah. Lots of tricks of the trade. And watching him work every night was like, you know, he he played great. He re, was a uh, you know, like playing with a, a rock star because he was a rock star. It was really great watching him. He knew how to do give a show, like really give a show, right? And uh, um, you know, he just always had like this great tone. He would spend, you know, like tone really mattered to him. So like, you know, it was he was rig was always be constantly being updated, and you know, but he was just great to watch him play because he had, you know, as it doesn't matter what gear you have, the tone is kind of in your hands. Mm. And anything, but like I learned a lot about like you know how to use a Marshall. I came in with a Marshall stack, and the first thing they did was they looked at me and they said, "It's the wrong one." You know, I was like, oh, "Well, it says Marshall on it." <laughs> what what, but, what change did they make? Pardon? What was it? What was the change they made? Well, what what happened? I brought it. It was a, one of those early Marshalls that had one of the first ones that had a master volume, like a M. It's an MVP series, but uh, it was like the first master volume Marshalls, and they were real fizzy sounding. It, it didn't. It sounded kind of, you know, like buzzy. So he, his tech basically took my Marshall apart and did something back there and made it sound a lot better. Hmm. Um, 
but you know, uh, uh, Peter had some great guys working for him for the new guitar, guitar rigs. You know, I was I like Marshalls, but I wasn't like I I didn't really have the DNA, the Marshall DNA that some guys really get a, a, a great sound out of it. I was always struggling with it. I'm really just a Fender guy. Yeah, it's amazing how many I would say. If I had a just a knee jerk reaction, um, I've probably done f- closing on a 450 interviews. I would say 75% of the people I've interviewed play vintage fenders. You can't go wrong. Yeah. You no, know, there, I mean, I, I kind of, my first good amp was a Super Reaper. Yeah. Which was loud, but it was good. And I currently play through a, a, a Princeton Reaper, like mm-hmm. '65. And that's the era; it's mid '60s. Yeah, there's some there's a magic that happened with those amps. You know, the amps are always a work in progress because, it's, unlike a guitar, you know, which can kind of be once it's got the right stuff. So it's always the same. The amp is going to need tubes. It's going to need, you know, well, you're going to blow it up somewhere along the line. Sure, it's constantly need maintenance but i've got a great amp guy and i just it, he keeps it sounding really great and uh it's still my favorite amp like i'll i'll use that with pretty much all my gigs now if i have to be a little bit louder i'll use something else but it's kind of the perfect clubbing it's you said it's a 65 princeton reverb yeah very cool all righty how about bonnie rate i gotta tell you i've interviewed probably four guys that have played with her well, I never toured with her. Um, I went through an era uh, in the 90s. I was doing a lot of sessions for Don Was. And I knew Bonnie because Bonnie and Jackson are like brother and sister. So we, Jackson would do a benefit and Bonnie would do that. Uh, there would be a lot of times we'd be playing, op, you know, like on the same show together or our band. There were many benefits where Jackson's band would back her up or, you know, parts of our band would back her up and she'd bring all the guys in there. Uh, but Don had, had me play on uh, a couple of al- her albums. Hmm. Nick of Time was one of them. And uh, I can't remember the other one. I, I played like, you know, I played a little bit of like guitar rhythm and uh, maybe just a little touch of acoustic here and there. I think on one thing I might have actually played like a oud. Oh, an oh, a oud? Yeah, what is that? I've heard that. I know I... So oud is like a, a Middle Eastern fretless nylon string, 11 string. Okay. Uh, David Lindley plays it extremely well. Me, not so much. It, it's O U D. Is that how it's spelled? D. Yeah. Okay. I think. But yeah, I played a few. You know, I did some recordings with her, so it was really fun. Fact, How'd you get hooked up with Don? Uh, through through a mutual friend. Don. Uh, we had a friend. Uh, her name's Deborah Dobkin, who also used to play with Jax and uh, Bonnie Ray. Uh, she recommended me Don because he was doing some sessions. And he was looking. He was just kind of. He was doing. Um, he was getting his his a foot feet wet as a producer, and he, he you know I guess he was just trying out some new guys, and so she recommended me for uh, recommended recommended me to him. So I went. He called me up. I went over to his house. We had a little studio set up, and we did. I did some overdubs on a track that uh, he was doing with Dylan, and I don't think I'd that ever made it out on a record. And then something with Paul Abdul on the same day. That's pretty cool. That was kind of cool. Uh, so anyway, he started hiring me for some some sessions. So I did stuff with the Bonnie. Um, I worked on things with uh, Willie Nelson, the uh, uh, Waylon Jennings. We did a bunch of all sorts of stuff. Uh, the Highwayman. Oh yeah, was was uh, in, um, did you work with Reggie Young? I did. The great Reggie Young. Yeah, he you know he passed uh, like two weeks ago. Did have you ever had you interviewed him? I did. It was a, a like a three hour interview. We scheduled scheduled it. This is really um, real quick story. When when I f- this is about a year a year ish ago, maybe thirteen fourteen months ago, and. Um, he said before the interview started, he said, Craig, I just want you to know my memory is not what it used to be. 
And I said, okay, man, that's, that's, you know, just be yourself. That's all I, you know, really would like. And, um, so like the first question I said, Hey, tell me about, I think the, his first band in the fifties was Eddie and the Stompers. I said, Hey, tell me about Eddie and the Stompers. And he goes, and he, he proceeds to tell me like how the band was put together, where they practiced the address <laughs> of the, the address of the name of the carpet store where they practice in the back, the name of the guy's dad that owns it, the name of the DJ that recorded them, the address of the DJ's building. And I'm like, man, wait a minute. You, you've you literally got a better memory than me. And you're like, ah, oh, I said, no, I'm serious. You've got a better memory than me. And you like preface this about your memory. So he was sharp as a whip and a very, very kind, sweet, very kind person. It was unbelievable in the studio with him because he's yeah just like just watching him play because he played you know his style was that style was that suspicious minds it was yeah. in the ghetto that was his thing you know and watching a guy like that's the way he played and he was playing it that style in front of me and i was like this is the coolest thing ever yeah that, um, that's cool nice he's a super nice guy and he and uh who was the there was a pedal steel player bobby turner on that session and they were playing this bebop like and they were like they stopped and they, they said okay they had me to learn it because it was one of these kind of licks where it just looped around and around and around so um it was really fun because they were like okay you're gonna learn this lick now because it was a great lick i'm like what are you guys playing you know uh they were you know he was a really a real gentle sweet guy yeah yeah truly was that's good that you what a crew man so you you that was a great session like you weren't expecting that well, yeah, not expecting. I mean, you know, it's pretty wild to be in the studio with Johnny Cash, Waylon Jennings, Chris, Chris, and then uh, 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 Willie. You know, that was pretty great. And then you put in Reggie, so you've got like the guitar Nirvana almost. And then we had uh, we. I can't remember if Don played bass. It might have been Hutch Hutchinson. Uh, Kenny Aronoff was on a lot of the sessions that I did with Don or Jim Kelton. So wow, either way, not a bad, not a bad I, rhythm section, man. The session, you know, very cool, man. Another one out. This was really cool. Joan Baez. You're not yeah. old enough to even have played with Joan Baez. I am. <laughs> uh, no, that was this was last year. Oh, okay. Uh, so Joan was doing what was going to be her last record and, and then she's going to embark on her last tour. Well, the last tour apparently is like now going into year two and, uh, you know, she might do another record, but she was like, you know, she was, first of all, she's fantastic. She's just a great person. Nice to hang around with. And she's like 78 or something. Never. You think she was in her fifties or something. She was just on top of it. And, and the producer on that record was Joe Henry. I don't. Who's Joe Henry? I'm sorry. Joe, you should look up Joe Henry. Yeah, he's a producer, songwriter, really talented guy. He's produced some great records. He produced uh, uh, Hugh Laurie's records, uh, Alan Toussaint. There's an Elton John record. Uh, Elton John and uh, uh, oh gosh, I'm a player wrote this masquerade. Leon Russell. Okay. Oh yeah. I may be getting slow, but I do sometimes remember those names. Yeah. Uh, uh, where, where was – now I've wandered off. Joan Baez. Joe, Joe, Baez. Joe Henry. Joe Henry. Fantastic producer. And we had – so the band – so they hired me to kind of – to be the guy in case Joan couldn't play her acoustic guitar parts while she sang in the studio but it as it turned out that she would play her parts great and sang great and so i i moved over to playing nylon string guitar and then we had greg lease have you had greg on your show yet no i have not greg on your show okay um, is an incredible guitar player steel player lap steel player mandolin player whatever you got he can play it he's not really is he related to howard lease i don't think so. i think it's spelled differently okay yeah i didn't think so but Greg is one of the killer guitar players around. And he's now playing with Jackson. <laughs> it's such a small world, isn't it? It's crazy. It is. I mean, it's, um, just, it's just amazing. Actually, it's really... I mean, Greg played on uh, the recordings of Hugh Laurie 
you know, I, I, would, I was playing live for. So yeah, I've known great. I've known great for a long time. Yeah, a nice guy. Very cool. Um, are you working on anything now that you're excited about, Mark? Um, let's see. Right now, you know, I put this trio record out last year. Um, we're just about to do a gig. Uh, as a quartet, we added a steel pedal steel player named Rich Hinman. I know Rich. Yeah, I interviewed Rich. I love Rich. Did yeah. you interview him? I did. I interviewed him about four or five months ago. Really nice guy. Super nice guy. You know, my my rhythm section, Jen and Jay, play with Rich and Adam Adam Levy. Have you done? Yeah. So you know Adam. Yeah. That's where I know Jay Bellaro's that name from because he plays with all those guys and they've all – mentioned his name to me separate well they're all it's like jen and jay are kind of like the the preferred rhythm section yeah a certain group of people right now and they're the greatest i love playing with them. um and so we had i i was going to book a couple gigs for my trio this year and jen suggested we had rich and um it's great because it helps i've kind of reimagined my stuff as a quartet it's nice to have someone else play some solos. Not that the, our, our music isn't shred-tastic. It's pretty low-key, in fact, extremely low-key. But uh, it's, it, there's, it is improvised in, to a certain amount. And uh, so just to have another improviser available, it, it lets us kind of stretch out of it. So it's really great. And I like the texture of like what I do on my electric guitar and what he does on the steel guitar. We're super compatible. That's very cool. Man. What talk about your trio record? What made you What made you put that out? And, and what kind of music is it? Well, I've been I've written uh, tunes over the past five years of just guitar based instrumental music. Not it's melody based. There is some improv in it. Um, it's not jazz. It's kind of ambient jazz. It's not Frizzelli in, in like I don't play like Bill Frizzell, but it might be even that. We're you know trying to use interesting musical ideas, uh, but it's not like uh, a technical chops show off. In other words, it's music. Yeah, people to listen to. Um, so my computer died a couple of years ago, and all my files were you know like all my music files were off on other uh, drives, and I was trying to piece together some stuff just to. You know, I was, I was like, I had all this music. I was like, oh, God, I got to start with this. And I started finding all these tracks that we recorded as a trio. And I kind of recorded it and then felt a little disenchanted with it. So I just kind of let it sit for a while. And then I started finding all these tracks. And then uh, I found some more. And then I was like listening to them and going, I put them on a playlist in iTunes. And I was driving around going, hey, maybe I should just, you know, I'm, I should make a record and get this thing out here already, you know. What, why am I waiting? It sounds pretty good. So I made it. I made a deal with myself that I would just, no matter what, I was going to finish this record and put it out. Because otherwise, I mean, I did my first my solo guitar record in 2004. You know, if I didn't put something. I mean, I don't have. That's like a long time between records. So I figured, okay, you're going to put it out. It doesn't matter. Stop lying about the solos. Just do it. So then I just made an intention and I just sat in my studio and I took the tracks and rebalanced them. We replaced some things that needed to be replaced. I did some new solos, maybe a, an overdub here and there just to kind of flesh out the, the sound of it. And uh, also I had a record. It was just, you know, I just said, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to give up. It's going to become a record. And it came out really good. That's awesome. It's, it's, it's a nice record. So, uh, It's just called Mark Goldenberg Trio? Is that the name of the record? It's, yeah, it's under my name, but the name of the record is Trio. Trio, awesome, very cool. And people, you, and uh, listeners, uh, listeners, that sounds so distant. You can get the record. <laughs> it, you can. It's available at markgoldenberg.com. dot um, It comes autographed, or you can get that on any of the. I'm assuming any of the streaming services. Yeah, it's available on everything. Great. Um, Amazon, Spotify, whatever you got out there. This is a tough question. Is it possible for you to pick like the top three musical experiences you've had for any reason? Maybe it was your, you were just in a zone or the hang was good or, you know, any, any particular reason that made that, you know, floats your boat. Well, I've had some pretty, I mean, 
really fortunate to have some great experiences. I had one of the top experiences was like getting to study with Ted Green. Yeah. It was amazing. Like probably the most realized musician I've ever met. Like he was on, he was whatever knowledge he had, it was beaming down from the books because he just was an extraordinarily intelligent musician and had, you know, it, it didn't even matter that he played guitar. He could have played the flute. It would have been the same guy. He was just incredible. And, uh, I was kind of, I was lucky to get lessons with him and I found him by accident. Uh, I was, when I first, when I got to LA, I was playing a lot of keyboards along with guitar and I'd studied, uh, with a guy named Abby Frazier, who was a a well-known teacher in LA of pianists. Uh, and he taught uh, piano and he taught counterpoint and jazz. So I took, I took all that stuff with him, but, he was an elderly guy and eventually he passed away. And then after that, I was like, I didn't, I don't know. I, I saw my guitar in the corner looking at me going, Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> Chance. Come back, come back. We miss you. So I thought, well, what the heck? You know, I started playing more guitar and I felt, I, fit, I felt like I was, I needed somebody to, I just needed a kick in the pants. I need somebody to like take, you know, take whatever it was I knew and, and, and take it up a notch. So, I started looking around for a guitar teacher and I found this guy named Joe DiOrio. Oh yeah. A jazz guitar player. I thought, well, maybe I should learn some jazz. Um, jazz guitar player. And he was teaching at the wasn't guitar. He, yeah. Wasn't he a G, GIT, right? Right. And then, uh, so I called him and he said, yeah, I could teach you, but you know, I don't, you know, unless you sign up for the school, you got to come down to Orange County for lessons. And I was like, no. I was looking in the Valley and, seemed like a bit of a drive. And he said, well, why don't you study with Ted Green? He's up in your neck of the woods. I had no idea who Ted Green was. And uh, he gave me Ted's number. And, and then I kind of, I nosed around and I found that he had written this book called Chord Chemistry, which I went out and bought a copy of. And I found it like inscrutable. I had no, I looked at all these chords. It was like l- reading, you know, Sanskrit or something. I didn't know. I had no idea what was going on here. It was way, way advanced for what I was thinking about. So I just called him up, and he was super nice and basic. Yeah, man, call me back in a month. And so I called him back in a month, and he said, oh, I'm really full right now. Call me back in a month. And it made me call him like four or five. I mean, it took about four months for me to get less, a lesson in. Was that like on purpose, like he was just weeding you out? I think so. Yeah. I think but to, you know, he didn't want anyone just to kind of casually study. He wanted some. He wanted to make sure that uh, you know you were a serious student. Although, and he was also really booked up. He had just you know, a lot of people that. You know. I I think Adam, if I remember, Adam may have studied with him. Adam studied with him. Yeah. A lot of his players have studied with him. Yeah. I know that even Ry Cooter took some lessons with him when he was doing the jazz album. Um, Ever. Everybody who played guitar of a certain era would at least get in there and take a lesson. It's not like I mean, I took the full, a full like slew of lessons for like eight years. But a lot of places would come every week. You'd go. I would go every two, three weeks. You know, he'd give me a lot of stuff to work on. So yeah, I was going to say, how do you? It's a big workload every week. Was. but I, I would. He would give me stuff, and I would like diligently work on it. Mm. I did learn, you know, some of the stuff. That I mean, everything that I play today, I think, is, is influenced by his knowledge. So he gets the, he gets the tip of the hat for the most incredible thing. And the great, greatest thing was uh, he asked me, you know, I went to finally get into the first lesson, and he asked me to play something. Well, at the time, I was listening to a lot of Brazilian music. A lot of what? I'm sorry. Brazilian okay. music. Brazilian music. And I was kind of playing some, like, you know, pseudo jazz in my own mind. So I played this stuff for him, this thing that I'd been working on, and it was, you know, I had a lot, a few bunch of chords strung together, and I thought I was pretty hip. And he looked at me, and goes, "Mark, that's great. It's like folk music." <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Uh, it was so great, though. I mean, you know, Ted, Ted is one of those guys that just he, he was a hundred percent made out of music and the stuff that he was writing, you know, he, he, if you go to his website, there's like thousands and thousands and thousands of 
lessons and sheets and arrangements and concepts that you can download. And there's probably, you know, there's enough there for several lifetimes of study if you did nothing else. Like, I don't know how he had the time to actually write that. Incredible person. That's and awesome. Be- and a beautiful guy. Like, the, when I think I started when the lessons were $14. And he would never, you know, he would hardly ever, ever raise the rates. So I think in after eight, at 10 years, I, I worked with him for eight years. I took a couple of years off, uh, came back, and he was up to $28. That's yeah. amazing. Amazing. He, he didn't want anybody to not have a lesson, you know, because they couldn't afford it. Ted, $28, this is bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> I gave him some more. I, at, a couple of times, I would, I, like I had 40 bucks or something, he said, Okay, I'll take it, but I'm just going to give the rest of the homeless guy. You know, <laughs> like he was a pretty, he was a very interesting guy, incredible musician. Well, I didn't realize he had a website. I'm going to go check that out. That's pretty cool. Dot com, um, and there's access to like gazillions of lessons. And I think I have some things that he wrote up for me that aren't on the website, but they're not. They're you know, like fragmentary. So. But there's certainly if they if you had an idea, a concept, or a question about anything in music. You can find a guitar centric answer there. It's a pretty incredible database of musical stuff. Plus, you know, I don't even know how he did it. There's so much there. You're real free. It's cool. And it's, uh, um, you know, it's free to everybody. I think they ask for a donation. That's really cool, man. It's really cool. So that was a, that was a pretty great thing. Um, I got to play on a session with Ringo Starr. Yeah, I meant to ask you about that. Talk- that was a top, top-notch uh, experience. Uh, uh, it was just when I was working for Don, and he, Don got to produce some stuff for, for Ringo for a record. Um, and uh, um, we were in the studio. We went to the studio to play with Ringo. He's there. There's Ringo. It's Ringo. Like, you know. Was it weird? It was weird because he's Ringo. I mean, how could it not? But he's so nice. And he's really like a, a warm guy. You know? he was, it was, he, he, he makes everybody feel comfortable. I think he works with a lot of people. He, he's got to have so much, pr- I'm sure that's genuine, but he's got to have so much pressure to do that in a sense because he's Ringo Starr, you know, like he's, it's almost a dis like he's he's got to go way out of your way just to level the playing field for him because of his uh, accomplishments or sort of you know yeah quite possibly you know he may yeah, it, it's possible that he has to feel like he has to be that way so people can hang out with him you know, because they're, you know in case in point we were at a recording studio and there were some other people recording their album at, in, it was in a complex of recording studios and. They freaked out that he was there, and they, they ended up like standing, just like they looked like statues. They were just standing out in, in like in the common area of the studio, just like, you know, like. You know. <laughs> I don't want anybody to notice that I'm looking to see Ringo. <laughs> it was like, and he didn't like he would go, you know, I think he was smoking at the time. I think he would go out for a cigarette, and he would just like come like that. Look, these guys, people are creeping me out. <laughs> but it, but I was like in there with Don was and. And me playing, I was think I was playing Rick twelve string, and it was Ringo. And and we're looking at, I look at Don, and he looks at me, and we start laughing because here we are, like two guys, you know. I'm from Chicago, he's from like Detroit or something. And we're playing with Ringo Starr, and the guy that you know, there's a guy in the room playing drums with us. It sounds just like Ringo Starr. You know? Yeah, he's, yeah. Phil, it would be like, oh, that's a Ringo, that's the Ringo Starr drum fill, you know. And he's you know with the thing with the hi hat, and he, he does all that, and it was so great, and it was so great to play with him too because. He's really good. Was he singing? He was, but it was, we were just cutting the tracks. Okay. So there was no vocals. Right. No vocals. We cut, we kind of knew what the, oh, I'm trying to think. I, I might be wrong on this, but I think Dylan O'Brien had written the song and Dylan might have been singing a guide track. Oh, wow. So you had Bob Dylan singing? No, Dylan O'Brien. Oh, sorry. I thought you said Bob Dylan. I'm like, did you feel tempted to, to like ask him, like, Beatles stories? I mean, you had to be curious. You know, I didn't. It was kind of, uh, it, we didn't go down that road for some reason. It was, it felt like, you know, we were like really there to kind of get get a couple of recordings. So there was, 
there was schmoozing time, but we didn't really get into the people told us about the yeah. thing. It was more like, you know, and I think that you know, that's what it should have been, you know. Yeah. Because I'm sure that it gets that. Oh, he's, the- that's, uh, he's got to have that nonstop. Are you kidding me? That's like the blessing and the curse of being a beetle. But he was, it was really cool. And certainly, like, you know, if you have to play with a beetle, I guess that would be a peak musical experience. You know? Oh, God, yeah. And what would be number three? Wow. Um, my dad took me to see Segovia when I was a kid. And um, that really was an amazing experience. Uh, I was, my parents, my mom was really musical. She played the piano. And my dad loved music and he loved guitar especially classical guitar. Um, so one of the like dad son things that we did together was we would go for classic. Well, he would go for classical guitar lessons. This is when I was younger and I would kind of like tag along and sit in the, the, they had a, the, the teacher's studio had like a waiting room and they had like guitar catalogs and things like that. His name was Richard Pick and he was, and this is, you know, I was, this is in the very late 50s, early 60s, late 60s, or early 60s. My dad studied with this guy, Richard Pick, who was in, in Chicago, the most well-known, prestigious classical guitar teacher. And he even had a, a Gibson Richard Pick model. Oh, so your dad was a serious classical player. A hobby. Well, he loved it. He loved the idea of it. He didn't, my dad didn't, my dad, had a, my dad was a doctor, so he had a full-time job. Oh, so he didn't, not a lot of time. Eight hours to practice a day. Um. But he loved it, and he was an aficionado. So he anyway, he wanted to t- learn how to play guitar. So he started taking lessons, and I would go with him. And, and I, I have to say that I was actually kind of relatively uninspired by the guitar. Um, but I did like look at the catalogs, and I was like, look, you know, while they're in there with classical guitars, the Gibson, there's a Gibson catalog there, and all these red guitars, you know. Like, well, that's, what is, I don't know what that is, but I like it. It's red. What was it like um, a, an SG or ES something? Yes, like they, it was like the catalog from the mid '60s. I remember, like it had every model in there. Some were sunburst, some were red, and they had an SG. The SG standard was I liked it because it had pointy horns. You know? it's like, yeah, wow, that's sharp. So, but my dad, in that process during that time he was studying, uh, he got the uh, Segovia came to town. Segovia at this point was elderly, but still okay. You know, still able to play, and we, he dragged me to a concert. Room. The amphitheater in Chicago. Anyway, I was like pretty young, like twelve or something. But there was twelve or thirteen, but there was like hearing somebody do that on a guitar was and be it being Scully, it was kind of amazing. That was an eye opening experience. And then I started at the, after that concert, I kind of got that little like, hey, you know, maybe I should play the guitar too. I didn't, you know, I had no idea how much work it would be to play, you know, to to be Scully. You have to Oh I yeah, play guitar. I can play the guitar. Did, did you start playing acoustic then, cl- classical? Yeah, my so couple this all with seeing uh, the Beatles on TV. I saw them on the Ed Sullivan show, and then at that point, it really clicked. I was like, "Dude, those guys are cool." And my parents were like, "Oh, what did that?" You know, like they couldn't handle the noise. My parents were kind of odd musically. They liked classical music, but they also liked kind of like weird experimental classical music. So the stuff that I heard in my house did not sound like Beatles, you know. They were, <laughs> so when the Beatles were on TV, they were like, what is that? They, they couldn't even relate, but I was like, I don't know, I was like genetically at the right moment, at, at, at the right place to hear the Beatles. And then sure. I just, I need to do that. So I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I need to do that. And he said, hold on there, Jim. Uh, why didn't, I'll tell you what. And I said, I need an electric guitar. I need one now. <laughs> Why you take classical guitar lessons for a year? If you take lessons for a year with Mr. Pick, then we'll get you an electric. Guitar. Oh my God, that's like a like saying you know if you go to prison for a year, exactly. You know, Just, then you can come out and I'll get you. You're almost like you know what? I'll get a job and for three months and get my own electric guitar. You know, smart, I would have done something like that, but they were cool, you know. They, and I, I kind of, I kind of dug where they were coming from because, like, you know, we were. My family was like my mom's side had like three classical players in it, and so they were like, I, you know, I was 
raised with that, like, you know, I took piano lessons and I played the French horn. So it was like, it didn't seem unreasonable or weird to me that I would be like, well, okay, I'll take more lessons because that's what I was doing anyway. Yeah, I was, okay. taking, I was taking French horn lessons with Mrs. Katz and I was in the in the school band and the school orchestra. And, I, you know, I was like a, a studious uh, grade school musician. Yeah, but that's really cool. I mean, like, you already had your thing going at a young age, you know? Absolutely. I, I Sadly for my dad, you know, my dad was like, well, you know, you can be a doctor. I was like, I knew like from the beginning that I want, I loved music. My mom was obsessed with music. So I was just like, yeah, I like music. No, I don't want to be a doctor. And then it was, it was then it was like, you can always play French horn and the musician is simple. <laughs> I was like, let's see, I could play electric guitar on stage with Jackson Brown, or I could play French horn in the symphony. <laughs> I, I did. I admit that I've been really fortunate. I've gotten to play with some really famous people. Oh my God! Yeah, I had a I have a good resume. If I need to get a job, I got a good one. Yeah. Uh, my parents didn't really seem to care about anybody that I played with. They weren't really familiar with that kind of music until I got a session with Neil Diamond. <laughs> and my mom, she was like, "You've hey, arrived." You you're playing with the jazz she called him the jazz singer right <laughs> from the movie <laughs> right so at that point i knew like then at the, from that point on they were like okay go ahead be in the music business that's so funny I, i've heard stories like that from other people like when the parents were a little bit removed from the the, the music of the day and then like finally it's like an offbeat kind of session with something or a you know a short tour with Somebody that was, you know, from that, their era that then, you know, but it was a name that was like, you know, all of a sudden you've arrived. That's quite funny, man. Yeah, I tortured my folks. With, you know, like as I was a teenager, you know, I, I graduated high school in 70. So from like 1966 to 1970, I had a room, I had a record player. And, you know, anytime I would get a record, I would play it a thousand times. I would try to learn it. I would, you know, or I would just trip out on these records and like you know i just tortured my parents with jimmy hendrix over and over and over again but uh oh pre-led zeppelin yardbirds um procol harem i loved procol harem my, my dad yeah. would like walk by the room he'd stick his head in and it would be you'd see this like look on his face like this it was kind of a cross between sadness and terror <laughs> sadness <laughs> beyond <laughs> disappointment is just sadness what you could have been <laughs> You didn't get Hendrix, but that's okay. I did. That song, and though, like, you know, you, you mentioned Procol Harum. You know, Whiter Shade of Pale is on. It's got to be just as a song, one of the top greatest songs of. I mean, how do you not listen to that and enjoy it? It's incredible. It's fantastic, and what a great band! And that guy, uh, uh, Gary Brooker, guy the, who's the singer. He, uh, I get, I can't remember. Whoever was the singer in that band hmm. was incredible. And then they had like the, the Matthew Fisher, the organ player, came up with all that stuff. Great Am band. Amazing stuff, man. Robin Trower came out of that band. Yeah, he. I've seen him two or three times. Um, and he, he sing. The last time I saw him was probably about four years ago. He sings now. Oh, really? I, I was shocked because he, you know, usually he has his, you know, he had that great bass player. Uh, Jameson, I think was his last name or something like that, but he passed away, but he was a great, and then he had other guys, but he, he was singing. It was really weird. So finally went, well, I'm going to have to sing. He need, I think he just put out a record recently. Like yes. Guys, you know, he's got to be in his mid-70s. Yeah, like, he wow. is. Yeah. He's still rocking. He's, you know, it's his, the, you know, Univide. Is it Fuzz first or Univide first? That's really the that, big question. Yeah, that was yeah. a big question, man. That's funny. You, you were an only child, I guess? I have a younger brother. Okay. Was he into music? He's, he is, he didn't choose music as a vocation, but uh, currently he's obsessed with playing ukulele. Very cool. Uh, I get the emails from him saying mahalo. <laughs> uh, but he like, he loved, like he just, just a few years ago, he thought, I think he went to Hawaii for something for his job and just something snapped in him. So now he's like in he's like in ukulele groups. He's like you know he's doing it, but he's not you know he doesn't have to do it for a living. So he's doing it because he loves it. Yeah, that's really cool. 
Were there any, yeah, so- um, I'm sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Uh, was there like, what were some of the lower points or the, or the, or some obstacles that you had to go through over the course of your career and, and how did you manage to get through them? Business, personal music, anything. Um, I went through, you know, I had, I think like I would have been really happy to be in a band. That would have just, I could have been a side guy in a band forever. Yeah, I can't hear you. Okay, cool. So I, yeah, I would have been happy to be like a guy just playing guitar in a band with, with a couple of plus tones and being in some, some kind of band that would just go on forever and that would be okay for me. I think that's what I would have been really happy with. But it just, you know, like I kept, you know, I would be in different bands, bands would break up, but, you know, I couldn't like, you know, playing with Jackson Brown was like a, a long-term band and that was really like the longest I'd been in any band. And when, and, you know, there came a point when Jackson just kind of went, you know, I'm going to move on to someone else to play in the band. And I understood it, but it also, that was a low point for me because I just like went, well, I just did this 15 years and it, it it was a kind of a shock to all of a sudden not be in that organization anymore. And that was kind of a low point. I mean, I didn't really know what to do next. You know, I didn't, I, I kind of associated myself with that camp. And I just kind of thought that that was what you know, I was going to be doing. You know, like some people keep their bands forever, like Willie Nelson, or Neil Diamond, for example. And Jackson went through guys and I had a really long tenure in that band. 15 years is, as long as anybody's ever been in a band. That's as with, long as I've heard. Unless you're a band member, I have not heard. I think that might be the longest that I've heard. And I, you know, and it wasn't like, you know, he didn't fire me or anything like that. He just, there was another tour and I all of a sudden I was not, you know, and, and it was weird. It was like, cause I know the guy who replaced me is a friend of mine. He was like, you know, I met him at Norman where Norman's rare guitars when he said, well, Hey, I guess I've replaced you. And I was like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Was kind of a, that was a musical low point in in that you know because it, I had this one gig for so long I wasn't I had kind of gotten out of the mode of like you know looking for gigs all the time and so so there was kind of a rough period I kind of retreated and studied classical guitar for a couple of years um, I was lucky to get a, a call from Hugh Laurie and I did a couple of years with him and then at that point I went like oh yeah. I'm okay now, but it took me, it was kind of just, I was weird. It's like a weird breakup, you know? Yeah. Well, it was, it is, yeah. It's not it's you or it's not yeah. you. <laughs> sure. In my case, it was, he's looking at me. He's going, it's not me. It's you. No, I'm sure that wasn't. You know, these guys just change. Yeah. You know, people want to hear different things. You know, I mean, I, I spent a long time playing with the guy and, you know, I'm a growing musician, but you know, I think he just started, you know, I looked over him one day and said, yeah, I'm tired of looking at that guy. Let's get a new guy over there. Mm. And he's, uh, you know, he wants to evolve as an artist. So, you know, that's that was okay. Well, tough. It was tough to get over that. That was that was a tough thing. Yeah, I think we all tend to. Um, if you are committed to your craft or your profession, I think it's a ne- very natural thing to sort of like. Like, who are you? Oh, I'm the guy that does this is as opposed to, oh, I'm, you know, Ann's husband or, you know what I'm saying? Or I'm father. You, you, you spend so much time doing something, you identify with that. And it's an awkward thing to, um, to not, you feel like you lose your identity is the problem. Not that you lost the gig. Yeah. You, you, if once your identity becomes what you do. Yeah. Sunk. So yes, I have to go through a lot of stuff to kind of get on the other side of that. Now it's I'm really just I mean it's such a great place. I'm happy. I play guitar. I have a nice guitar with a big whammy bar on it. <laughs> I, like it's you know I I I play when I want to play my music. I can go play my music with my friends. And that's great. Yeah, that is good. I have jobs. You know, I do music jobs. But, uh, you know. Now it's not about, you know, I'm not, I've got to a point where who I am is not my gig. You know, it's funny you say that many, many years ago, like in 94, I was working, I, I was a financial planner and I started with this company 
and I used to have to make like literally like 400 cold calls a week. And as you'd imagine, most of those calls are no, you know, they're not interested in talking to you. It's like the last thing they want to talk about. Anyway, so I, I, I was, I was going to counseling at the time and I said, man, I, I feel like a loser. I feel like, you know, I'm not being able to do this. I feel like I'm a disappointment to my wife anyway. And then I think the therapist said something about, well, you know, who you are is not what you do. And I said, I need to, I took a, uh, like a frame and I hung it above my desk and I said, who you are. And then I had a line and said, what you do, because I needed to tell myself that like all day long while I was getting my ass kicked on the phones, you know? Um, and it really helped because it is such a, you know, you do feel that affinity when you're, when you're putting so much into something, you know, really interesting. It could, it, I remember when, when you meet somebody in America, you always, you, one of the things, first things you ever say to somebody is, what do you do? So what do you but, do? Right, right. But if you go to Europe and other places, Europe especially, no, no one ever asks you what you do. They just Really? You know, it's like your career is just, it's not, that's just your job. Whatever it is that you're doing is your job. You know? it's, an, it's an incidental. They don't define interesting. That sounds a lot healthier, man. I think so. Hey, meditating. Meditating helped me a lot. It's a, it, just changing my viewpoint helps a lot. How many, how often do you meditate? Every day. How like how how long a block? Every day. What's that? Twenty minutes. Every That's day. a lot, man. Good for you. It keeps me going. It keeps me yeah. sane. I've talked to a lot of players meditate, and and that seems to be the standard. The twenty minutes. I've talked to some guys who do twenty minutes twice a day, and I'm like, whoa. You know, I don't know if you said it. But you're, uh, you meditate twice a day and you're still, you're still edgy. You should meditate even more, you know, like, but it works once, once a day works for me. You know, yeah. sometimes I think my kids would say I'm napping. <laughs> <laughs> try to do it in, in, in an area where there's nobody around. Sure. Well, you didn't start at 20 minutes. I'm sure you started at like probably two minutes or worked your way up probably. Right. I did. I started actually like at five minutes. And five, when I first started, five minutes of meditation seemed like about an hour. Yeah, I'm sure. It's hard to really still everything. But once you kind of get more into it, the more you do it, the more it's a great place to be. It's hard to stop your mind from wandering. It is. But that's kind of part of it, too. It's yeah. like mind will wander, and the, 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 the trick is reeling the mind back in. Yeah. Getting into that still place. Did you read uh, the, the book 10% Happier? No, but I read the uh, pers- what is it? Hang on, I'll tell you what it's called because I have it right here. Ten percent happy. I I just finished the book called the I just finished the book called the Happiness Equation. Okay, S- similar what? thing. Yeah, similar. Exactly. Okay. I'm happy. Um, switch. Talk about guitar and gear for a little bit. Do you still practice? Yes, I do. I practice for. Like ninety minutes a day. Oh, that's awesome! What, what yeah. did you What did you last practice? Like, what were you working on? Um. So, I there's a book that came out by Ralph Towner because it's called uh, Improvisational Techniques, something like this for classical and acoustic guitar players. So it's basically some right hand exercises and some scales and some different things, but it's it. He uses his kind of Ralph Towner, uh, late seventies uh, ECM hippie jazz kind of vocabulary. So it's <laughs> it's great, and it's really great right hand stuff. And and I teach so because I teach, I teach privately, and I also teach at the Los Angeles College of Music. I'm using that stuff in my classes. So you know, a lot of a lot of my practice is just uh, catching up on some things that I know I'm going to teach. And then um, th- there's a certain method that the school teaches, so I- I'm trying to get through their all of their textbooks, so I'm like able to teach whatever it is that they need to teach. But yeah, I, pr- I do like I have warm ups and I do scales and uh, I do chord studies, things like that. I, I when I finished with this Ralph Towner book, I got some Jimmy Weibel etudes that Adam, Le- Adam Levy sent me. 
by the I, way. I know a bunch of guys that studied with him too. Yeah, he was he, the other. He was the other Ted Green, is it? Yeah, uh, another great mind, really great mind out here. Yeah, and uh, so there's a you know there's so much to study. It's endless. Yeah. So, so I like to practice. It keeps my you know I'm not as you know, I'm 66 years old, so I need a little warm-up time to get my fingers moving. Sure. But uh, I find that also studying just keeps, keeps sharp. I, uh, recently, I studied, I took some lessons with uh, Bill Kanegeiser, who's a classical guitar teacher at USC. Uh, and that was really good. And I, I took a, a lesson with Bruce Foreman. Do you, have you had Bruce on your... Uh, no. Bruce Foreman is like a great jazz player here in LA and also a great teacher. So I took like a you know a jazz lesson. I'm actually due for another lesson and soon. But yeah, I, I like to I like to as long as I'm teaching, I like to be studying at the same time. Yeah, that's pretty healthy. I think it's, it's also gives you some credibility. I think with your students in a, in a weird not in a weird way in, in a in a very direct way. Like you know, school's never out for the pro kind of thing. You know, exactly. I don't want to ever you know, teaching a student and, have, and, and not being able to play. I mean, I just don't want to. I want to be able to. I like playing the guitar, so it's like it's a great. Hey, it's I like fly fishing, but I think it's more fun than fly fishing. <laughs> I like the so I, you know, I, I never. Of course, there are some days when I look at the guitar and I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm fucking practicing, but I practice some. You know, but most days I'm, I'm happy to be there. Yeah. What's your go-to guitar right now, and like, what other two would round out your top three? Well, um, currently. For electrics, I've been playing a couple of Dano casters. Interesting. A guy, his name's Dan Stain. He makes kind of relic Fender clones uh, in Nashville, and they're great. I have a I have a Telecaster style and a Jazzmaster style guitar of his, and they're awesome. They're just really great. Like the Telecasters, I've had a lot of old Teles. I like Teles, um, and this is by far like the best of, of that whole. It's an incredibly great guitar. Resonant plays really well. Um, I love old tellies, but they, the really early ones have like a seven and a half inch radius. So you have to get the strings pretty high if you want to do any bending. Um, and this guitar has a more of a, like a 9.5 radius, but it's mm. super resonant and light. He does make relics. So it does look like somebody dragged it behind their car for a couple of years. It's really not even the issue for me. It's like it wasn't like oh, I need to play something that looks old like me. It was. <laughs> uh, you look great, man. Thank you. I picked up the guitar in the store. It said, "You're coming home with me." So the guitar talked to me, and that's usually how how it is with me and guitars. You know, if I put, pick it up, and there's usually like some kind of connection, then I that I go in. I've ordered some guitars, and I have actually have a guitar on order right now. But sometimes the guitars that I've had built for me, you know, you never know what you're going to get. From from the, the same? Different, the makers. Okay, okay. I, have Not- ordered, I never ordered a guitar from him. I, there's a local store here called LA Vintage Gear, which is where I kind of get my, my stuff these days. Hmm. They're a great store, and they, they carry Danicasters. And there aren't that many places to carry them. So I, I it's hard for me. Like I, I'm not very comfortable like buying a guitar online without it playing it yeah you got to play it man i mean i mean you don't have to but yeah i do i yeah. you know an amp, I, amp is a different thing or a pedal i don't care i don't i don't need to play the amp necessarily i can buy that online but a guitar is so i mean you know it's a it's a tactical tactile experience where you're touching it and like you know those tiny little variances in a neck shape or a string height or or how it just like resonates those make the big difference huge yeah i agree Everybody's different too. It's funny, like you know, one guitar that I might pass on, someone else is going to love it to death. Sure, you know, it's it's so, so personal. Uh, so yeah, Danicaster is a top two electrics. One's a Jazzmaster style, which I recently got. I love it, and um, Atelier. And then I have a Collings Acoustic, which is kind of like my main acoustic. Um, it's a double O size, so I think it's called an O O one M H. It's all mahogany. A lot of people, I've spoken to a lot of players, even on the electric side, they're building some great guitars. Uh, a lot of people have their, it's like I think if I remember correctly, it's an I-35, which is yeah. the 335. Yeah, I went to the NAMM show. Uh, I mean, I see Collins all the time. They're just, 
they're making great, great yeah. guitars. You know, their their acoustics are they're super solidly built. They're not heavy, but they're just like you know the, the build quality is incredible, and they're like they don't. It's like they don't feel they don't feel flimsy. They but they're not. They're, they feel like they're overbuilt, but they're light. I mean, it's hard to describe what they're doing, but it's just like you just pick it up and you go, oh, this is a proper guitar. This is a really well-made guitar. And their elect- electrics are the same thing. And I picked up a, a 330, their version of a 330, which had like a couple of P90s on it. I was like, wow, this is a, just a great guitar. I mean, you know, they're, a lot of what they do is similar to other brands. Like the, they make their acoustics are kind of in the, in the Martin camp and their guitars are kind of, kind of in the Gibson camp, but they're doing them and they're doing them really well. I like them. Super great. So my, my Collings acoustic is, it's kind of like, like it's a workhorse for me. Very cool. man. Any new players you're listening to now or who are you listening to now in general at guitar wise? Guitar wise. Um, uh, besides Rich Hinman. Again, well, after Rich, who is there else to listen? To? I I know, I know it's a, tr- a this very loaded question. I know. Uh, I, okay, so I like um, Julian Lodge. Hmm. As he's pretty like ridiculously amazing. I mean, I'm not a subscriber to the Lots of Notes school of playing, um, but somehow he does it, and it's really musical, and it's like seems effortless when he does it and it doesn't seem to be about anything like there's a, a school of guitar playing where there is you know playing a this little gunslinger approach to playing guitar like, sure i can play a lot of notes and you can't um but he doesn't seem to be in that category i think he's just has a general joy of existence that comes out of his playing so i like him a lot i love bill frizzell of course um I heard a record just recently by a guy named Jacob Bro, B-R-O. He's a European guitarist. Made a really nice live record. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. I actually don't listen to guitar playing all that much. Hmm. I listen to more, more piano playing. That's interesting. What kind of music uh, do you like to listen to? Um, I like to listen to... Man, I, I like pretty much everything. Like... I mean, last week I was obsessing on Dinosaur Jr. That's funny. This band, this guy named S. Carey, uh, who's a singer songwriter, and I think he plays with Bonnie Bear. He's the drummer, but he made a solo record. It's really beautiful. Um, I'll tell you. I'll, I'm going to give you my play. Love and Rockets. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, I know them. Uh, the Jesus and Mary Chain. I mean, really. So you're going Eleven Rockets are back from the eighties. Yeah, I listen to I listen That's to That's funny. Like, I have their album, the actual like final. Um it really it's really crazy. Uh it's nothing that I, I like I'm looking at my list here. It's like Dinosaur Jr. Um, you talk about a great fuzz tone, man. That guy is it. Man, he gets a lot of sound out, out of a big buff. Uh, totally. Radiohead has a new single that I really liked. Uh, I'm sorry, who? Radiohead. Okay, yeah, yeah. Then I list, I found a solo acoustic, ba- like a string bass record by this guy named Bar Phillips. Randomly just found it, and it's incredible. It's just like it's like a whole record of just a guy playing the bass. <laughs> but you know, it's it's beautiful. Um, I found this band called Hammock. H a m m o c k. They're super ambient. It's like it's imagine just like there it's just so there's no melodies but it's beautiful i don't even know what it is so there you go that's a wide range yeah man it certainly is Very. Oh, I, there was oh uh my son i my son and i share a playlist and it looks like he's been listening to weezer i'm gonna have to talk to him about that <laughs> stacy's oh, mom has got it going on have you heard mary halverson Mary Halverson? No. She's a New York jazz player. She's, you know, I like people who like, when you hear them, you know who it is right away. Right. She's one of those people. I'll check her out. She's great. And then I found this guitar player. She's from Iran. 
and her name is Golfam Kayam. And she makes, she's got a duo with a clarinet player. She plays like nylon string guitar. And uh, it, it's like nylon string guitar and clarinet. And it's absolutely gorgeous music. And it's kind of hard. To, it might be like, you know, what you might consider new classical, you know, like classical. It's, it's a lot of new classical that is, that is influenced by the popular music that we listen to and, and ethnic music and yeah. And it's like stuff, it's not like rehashing Beethoven. It's, it's a whole other approach to music. It's That's weird. happening all over, man. Like, you know, jazz has got tons of guys playing bluegrass and jazz. Like, there's a whole scene, a whole freaking scene of like bluegrass jazz guys. Um, you know, Ju- Julian yeah. is, is one of them. His, his, uh, he did a record with Chris, um, uh, Chris Eldridge from the Punch Brothers. Yeah, that's a beautiful record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, there's a lot of great music coming out. Yeah, really good stuff. It is super pop, but it's really a lot of good stuff. Now it's Klein. There's another guy's killer guitar. Player. He's coming on my show like in a week or two. He's an amazing guitar. Player. Yeah, he is. Sometimes, you know, he's another one of those guys. That sometimes he plays a lot of notes, but they're all and sometimes he plays just a lot of great sounds. And I go, wow, how do you do that? That's yeah. really cool. So I, you know, there's it's a really great time. Like, it's 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 good. It's a golden age. It's like a golden age of a lot of things guitar oriented. I mean, guitars. There's so many people making great guitars. There's pedals have gone crazy. Yeah, totally. It's a great time to be a guitar. Desert Island Discs, man. Cool. Are you? Uh, Just for today. I mean, not like knee jerk reaction. Revolver. Had to be up there. Uh, at sounds. Um, Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, or maybe the Second String Quartet. Uh, Steve Reich, music for eighteen musicians. So I can, if I'm on that island, I need to be able to go to sleep. <laughs> and. Uh, how many? How many was that? That was Led four. There's no Led four, maybe. Um, Dinosaur Junior, best of. <laughs> wow, you're really into Dinosaur Junior now, huh? It's, it's a, it's just a current obsession. It's going to go away. Hmm. It'll be fine. Um, uh, wow, I do. Uh, let's see. Let me think. So many records. It's really tough. Uh, I like this. There's a record by a composer named Johan Johannesson. He's a film composer. He made a record called Orfe, which is kind of like minimalist, uh, a soundtrack for a movie that was never made. He wrote the music for the, the that film, The Arrival. Really good composer. Anyway, I'm think, I think that a lot. Uh, our, well, Probably Electric Ladyland. Great record. It's my favorite Hendrix record. That's a good yeah. That's a good record. All righty. What would you say is that the, these questions are kind of tough from here on in. Best decision you ever made? Um, wow. That's a tough question. Uh, I think the best moving to California was a pretty big thing. I could have stayed in Chicago and been a larger fish in a smaller pond, but coming to California, especially, you know, I came out with a band that did that failed, and I had to kind of reinvent myself in order to survive here. And I, I got really lucky. I got, you know, I, I was down to my last buck. And I got a job playing guitar with Al Stewart right before Year of the Cat came out. Wow. And if I had stayed in Chicago, that would not, would have not have happened. So I think moving to California was big. What year and, did you move out there? Uh, I came, I, I think, 74, 75. Oh, you've been there a long time. Yeah, my blood is thinned out. I'm California. So you got out there really young. I did. Um, 
I was in Chicago and I had a band. We were called the Eddie Boy Band. Um, we got lucky and got a record deal with Universal Records. And we, in our wisdom, decided that, well, the best thing that we could do now that we have a record deal is move to California. I'm not really sure why <laughs> we thought that, but California to record a record. We made a record. Uh, it was te- We did not do ourselves proud on making that record. Uh, we did not make a great record, and our fans in Chicago were disappointed. And we we kind of couldn't go back because our it would be like going back with our tails between our legs. Uh, so the band basically stayed in California, but the band broke up, and some guys, oh, most everybody's actually stayed in California. But uh, I think that you know coming to California was really that was a big big thing. So, awesome. It was a good time to be in LA because you get. You could drive across town, town in 20 minutes. Yeah, I've I heard that. Those old block. days. Store in 20 minutes. <laughs> and this is a tough question, really tough for musicians especially. What, what do you like most about yourself? I think I, I like my – I'm pretty curious as a musician. Like I'm always looking for new stuff, new sounds. I'm constantly listening to new music. And as as a musician, that's I like my curiosity and uh, and my willingness to try to grow. I'm a kind of obsessive practicer and I'm trying to push my own, trying to push myself to be better at my instrument all the time. And I really feel like a, you know I've been a songwriter, I've done it all, but really feel when you know if you ask me what I am, I'd say besides who I am, I'm a guitar player. That's what I really like to do. I, play. I love to play the guitar. Flip side, if there's one thing that you could change, what would you want to be? What would that one thing be? Oh, I don't know. Um, I think I've, I've been pretty insensitive. Really? You know, to other people. I've been pretty like, say egomaniacal but you know self-centered is, is a good word to use and uh, I think that's a part of myself that I now you know more I I have more awareness of myself now than when I was younger you know? uh, so I wish I had been less self-centered man thank you that's a, a, a bold owning that what was there a trigger like what prompted you just say, you know, I need to be less of a self-centered person. Well, there were a number of triggers. You know, people. I think all, there were many triggers along the way, but I wasn't receptive or open to the signs when they went by. Yeah. But you know, I think uh, you get to a point. I got to a point in my life where things weren't working as well as I thought. You know, like just I would be like, what? What's going on? Why aren't things working? Why do I feel? Why am I feeling bad? And I started going with therapy. Yeah. And learning to become a more aware, conscious person. It, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress, of course. But I think, so I'm trying to, you know, make better choices, be a more uh, aware person right now. So, Good for you, man. Thank you. That was cool of you to share that. It's funny, the... Uh, the last interview I had, we had a whole conversation about almost uh, not not about be, being self centered, but about going to therapy and like how like y- you know if you want to stretch and it, you know you need to get some help, man. You know, and and that's definitely a, for him, for me, for clearly for you, it's been a very helpful, healthy thing to do. To um, and it's funny you mentioned Europe, my wife is from the UK and I remember this is a long time. I don't know if it's changed. I remember I went over with her to meet her mom in 93 and uh, we went out with a bunch of her friends. God, I can't believe how long ago that was. Um, There were kids then, you know, so I'm 55. So they were in like late twenties, early thirties. And uh, I mentioned something about therapy. They're all like, therapy? He goes, all you Americans go to therapy, don't you? <laughs> I, know, you know, 
love it. <laughs> I don't know if it's still like that. I'm sure it's not. I'm sure everybody's in therapy everywhere. But um, it was just very funny. You know, it's that it's that idea of, or you know, suffering by yourself. That's not. This is just not a good idea. No, that's not very romantic. And th- on paper, it sounds great. In reality, it's fucking awful. It's nice to have. I mean, just to be, to have to be in a place where you can say your truth to somebody who's listening to you, not judging you. Yeah, and then can come up with some help. Right. The, the action steps. That's what I got out of it. Uh, you know, you stuff, you know? So yeah, yay for therapy. Yeah, man. Cool. Thank you for sharing that more. Um, something or someone you miss from your childhood. Wow. Uh, well, you know, my parents are both gone. Uh, my mom just recently passed. I miss my dad. He died. My dad died. Like while I was on working with Jackson Brown. I missed my dad. My dad and I weren't super close, but we, you know, in fact, we had some pretty rough spots. But I, as he got older, we were able to kind of like go. That's great. Some of the rough spots. And so I miss my dad, you know, it's like he was, he was a very, very intelligent guy, really cultured and just, you know, uh, you know so I kind of miss him. And I have some friends, uh, Steve, uh, I miss my friend Stephen Bruton. Do you know him? Stephen who? Bruton? No. He's a singer, songwriter, and great guitar player. He played with Bonnie Ray. We both had studied with friend uh, with uh, Ted Green. He was a dear friend. And uh, yeah, I miss him. But it wasn't for my child. So I miss my grandparents, actually, a lot. My, my grandfather, uh, my, my dad's dad was an interesting guy, and he was a magician and a and a communist and a hardcore, wow, hard, kind of like a 1950s sort of way. And you know, my grandma was was also they're all communists. Like, you know, it could have been the Rosenbergs. They were pretty hardcore. That's she wild. Made a pancake. She what? Made a great potato pancake. <laughs> That's funny. Um, do you have any non musical superpowers? Um, you do. I don't. I don't know what they I, are. I can make a pretty good uh, breakfast burrito. <laughs> Isn't that a requirement to live out in California? You know what? I grew up my, my for some reason my dad loved Mexican food, and so he when I when we were going to these guitar lessons, part of the tr- the the carrot for me was we would go he would go have a lesson, then he would take me out to eat at a Mexican restaurant in Chicago. Oh, which, that is so cool! In those days, there you know there there. Chicago had Mexican communities living in it for a long time. And so there was good Mexican food. So I've always loved Mexican food. So at, when I got into college, I, I went to the Chicago conservatory and I have, I, found, I got an apartment on my own. And I, I remember like the week I moved into the apartment, I realized I didn't know how to cook anything. <laughs> All I knew how to make was a fried egg sandwich, <laughs> which is yeah. delicious. Quite good. But you know, I've, you know, the stents I've got now to prove it. Uh, oh. Read oh, my God. I don't have stents. But, you know, anyway, that's all I could cook. So I had, to, I decided I was going to teach myself how to cook. So I went and bought a Be- Betty Crocker cookbook. And I learned how to, like, boil water. You know, I had to learn <laughs> how to do, make spaghetti. So I was, like, always been, like, my hobby. You know, I like to cook. Um, I do a lot of the cooking around the house here. You know, I make a lot of kids. But I can, you know, yeah, superpower would be like making a great breakfast burrito or, you know, uh, whipping up a burrito in general is pretty good. Number one hobby of musicians, cooking. Is it? Yes, by far. I mean, it's similar. You know, it's a yeah. creative. It, there's a bit of improv involved in it. It's you exactly know? what everybody says, man. Very much. Well, I was laughing when you said I bought a Betty Crocker cookbook. People don't realize that. There wasn't any other options back then. It was probably like a Betty Crocker or, you know, Entenmann's or whatever the other big brand, you know, that released the cookbook was. It wasn't like now you go into the store and it's a section of cookbooks, you know. Oh, yeah. Now, now it's like you, if you wanted to learn how to cook a particular regional Spanish cuisine, you know, in an area that's like four square miles, yeah. now there's a cookbook for it. Right? Absolutely, which is great. You know, especially – Way back in the day when I was, you know, this is talking like 
in the early 70s, it was just the beginning of like gourmet culture. You know, people, cookbooks were literally, you know, how to make uh, meatloaf. Yeah. You know, like jello casserole with pineapple. Yeah, stuff. right, right. It's hilarious thinking about that, to be honest with you. Um, what's your favorite place you've traveled, man? You've probably been all over the world. Wow. I have been. I, 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 I've been, I've, that's a tough one. I really like going to Italy and I like going to Spain. I love the culture, the lifestyle, the eats are good, people are nice. Um, so yeah, I would say Mediter any the Mediterranean countries that I visited, Italy, Spain, south of France, fantastic. I would go there. I could live in Italy and be happy. That's also, <laughs> Spain is a very popular answer for that. Spain is fantastic. I, two years ago, was it three years ago, I went we toured with Manolo Garcia, who's a big Spanish artist. He played like base, you know, like giant arenas and a bull ring. You know, it was great. And we were, we, st I was there for eight weeks and did eight gigs. So holy I had, shit, I was great. I had an apartment in Madrid, and it was like around the corner from the Prado Museum. And we didn't, we didn't overwork. You know, they like we would leave on a Friday for a gig, and we had we started rehearsals at the beginning of the tour, but it was like. Just being in Madrid, it was like being Spanish, you know, living their lifestyle. It was pretty great. That's really cool. Did your wife get to come over there at all? or she didn't, unfortunately, because the kids were in school. The timing was really bad. Yeah. You know, it was, you know, I was there for work. So even though I had time off, it wasn't. That's really work. cool, man. Yeah, pretty great. And Japan's great. I've been to Japan many, many times. And, in, uh, and I, of course, it's Mark, toughest decision you ever had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? Wow. I don't know. I can't think of anything. Honestly, I mean, I, I, of course, you know, I've had bumps in my life, but I feel maybe it's because I, right now, I'm feeling pretty lucky to be here now. Um, you know, I've had some, you know, I've had some experiences like I've had, you know, I've been, I've had a couple of failed marriages and those were rough, but I bounced back off of those. Uh, this is, so this is third, third time's a charm. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> you said 20 years, man. You know, you know, I, you know, it's really interesting because, um, I, like I said, I'm 55 and we have, and my wife's my age, we, and we see people all around us either divorcing or um, like n they're married, but they're not together. Mm -hmm. And um, like some of them live multiple, li like different lives. Like he's dating this one or she's, and I'm always in a way kind of impressed with that because I, can't manage the one life I have to live that I'm like open with. <laughs> and I'm like, in a way I'm like, God, how do you do that? That's like a talent. I wish I had that. Like not, I wouldn't use it for that purpose, but like, you know what I mean? It's like, wow, that's really, that's a lot of stuff to manage. It know? is. I, 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 I don't know what I, I, I don't judge. I think whatever. Makes people happy. Yeah, no, I'm not judging. I'm just like, Whoa. How do they do it? Yeah, I'm like, whoa, this is pretty amazing. I mean, you know. Um, well, you know, I got like a double life with my family and my, and my guitar. And the guitar is like a different family. A, a mistress of a different a, a different kind of mistress. Exactly. There you go. Two more questions, man, and I really appreciate your time and uh, your candor. Best advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you? Uh, Ted Green. Mark? You're only a fret away from a good note at any time. That's great. That is really great. Yeah, he would. Of course, he would always say that to me after I would, like, like for example, I came in with a horrible arrangement that I did somewhere over the rainbow. I mean, literally, I tried so hard to put a chord on every note. It was just unplayable. And, you know, as the, my friend would say, hey, is that hard to play? Because it's hard to listen to. <laughs> 
That's yeah. a, that's pretty funny. Is it hard to play because it's hard to listen? That's great. My, my Stephen Bruton said that to me many times. Uh, he was the master of musical insult. Uh, things like, he would say things like, well, your parents must be very proud. Or, I didn't know music could sound like that. That's when I'm <laughs> I still use that one. I didn't know music can sound like that. Last, um, last question. Anything you regret not doing? Yes. I, I had a 1957 Les Paul. Get out. And it was the greatest guitar I ever had. And I used to play it on my gigs. And I didn't love it enough to always take it myself and have it with me. And I was on a music stand. And it fell off a group of, from another band, knocked it off, and it fell off, and the headstock broke off, right? Mm. I took it to a well-known repairman, who shall remain nameless, and I asked him to uh, put the headstock back on the neck, just put it back together, right? The guy who was kind of famous for not being that the, the guy who would follow your directions decided he would craft a new headstock. Oh, my God. And he put it on my guitar, and it was the wrong. It was a. It was the wrong angle. It was the wrong. It was too big. It was like he copied an SG. You know, like how SGs are bigger than Les Paul has. It was too big. Wrong angle. It didn't even feel like the same guitar. The guitar was root. Literally, like I was shattered. Like the, he, the, I pulled the guitar out of the case and I picked it up, and it was wrong. It just felt wrong. It didn't sound right. And I said, "Hey." I didn't want this. I want, where's the headstock? I want the original headstock. So we threw it away. And dude, do you I, want to out him right now? I'm not going to out him. Cause you know, he's still around. Um, Oh my God. I hope you gave him a bad Yelp rating. Well, I they didn't have, <laughs> so what I regret was, I regret a not oh. punch the guy in the nose. Cause he really fucked a good guitar. Oh, B I'm sorry. I sold the guitar because it, it hurt me so much. I couldn't play it. Like it was like I opened the case and I just, it was like ruined. Yeah. And, but I'm sorry I'd sold it because the, you know, that guitar, even with the, I could have bought another house. Probably. Yeah. Well. But it, it was just like, you know, it was too traumatic. You know? So I kind of regret that guitar and that experience with the guitar. You'd wonder, that's almost like a doctor, like cutting off the wrong limb. I mean, like who, like the wrong, not only the wrong limb, but he removes a leg instead of an arm. I mean, like, how do you, oh my. Not, the guitar was wrong. You know? Now in hindsight, I, you know, I probably could have had someone else do something with it, like redo that, but still then it would have been like a third neck surgery. No, no. At that point, not having the original neck. After that, you're like shot. You're 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 shattered. Should have saved the pickups at least, though, right? Oh my god! Yeah, you know, it's fifty-seven gold top with humbuck PAFs. It was really a great. It was great guitar. Seriously great. But, wow. You know, there must have been. You know, now I look back. Well, there was you know, the universe wanted needed me to do that. Yeah, the universe wanted you to get rid of that guitar for some reason. So now you know. To me now, I look at a guitar and I love my guitars. I've got some great guitars, but they're screwdrivers. You yeah, know? tools. Just tools, you know. I'm the guitar, really. Yep. And tools. So I, maybe I needed to learn that. I would. It took me a long time to get to that point. Now I'm like, not. Nah, I've thinned the herd. I doesn't bother me. In fact, less guitars is better. Very cool, man. Let me uh, tell people where to find you and. Uh, a little bit of some stuff you're doing. So your last records, the Mark Goldenberg trio, um, check that out. It's on markgoldenberg.com and it's also anywhere you could uh, stream. You can find Mark on Facebook at Mark Goldenberg music and on Instagram at M Goldenberg 52. Um, lessons. Mark gives lessons. So, if you want to contact him about that, please do go to the contact tab on markgoldenberg.com. And he's a guy who's incredibly well studied and he's incredibly well traveled as both a session player and a touring musician and a writer. So um, I would definitely check him out. And you are going to play, you got this solo show at the Argena Acoustic Music Series in Little Rock on April 18th. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. The, um, Eric Sky, my buddy, 
has played there before, and he hooked me up with the guy Steve Davis who's putting together. And I just, I literally just sent him an email and said, "Hey, you know, do you want to play? You know, Eric and I put together a record of acoustic guitar duos a few years back. And, uh, I I do shows as a solo guitarist, or you know, in California uh, around, and I just kind of randomly just shot one off to him, and, and he said, "Yeah, come on, I'll play this guy. Awesome. So, um, I'm waiting. I'm going to do a record of solo guitar of some sort in the near future. I'm waiting on an arch top that Megan Wells is building. You know, planning to record something on that. You know, using that as the main thing. Awesome. So that yeah, I just kind of, as my lawyer used to say, say if you don't ask, you don't get. That's right, man. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. And also, you're at the La Conner guitar festival may 10th through 12th in beautiful la Conner, washington where is that it's north of seattle like 90 minutes north okay so it's and it's beautiful up there and yeah. uh, i'm actually up there to demonstrate megan wells archives very cool and that's may 10th to 12th and is all that information also on your website it's on my website yeah absolutely great on, on my page. so check out mark online at mark goldenberg.com and it's mark with a k m-a-r-k dude anything i missed uh instagram m goldenberg 52 you can find me there um i like to one of my little other hobbies is weird photography so i take pictures and put, post them on instagram and i also announce my gigs and very cool all things guitar related awesome Mark, thank you very much for everything. I really appreciate your time, and thanks for being so cool and for sharing some nice stuff. My pleasure. Everybody, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it with a friend in your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks again to Mark Goldenberg for spending time with us. Please check out Mark online and go back, and I'll say this one more time. Man, just want to see some just beautiful, beautiful electric guitar solo. Go to YouTube and search for Jackson Brown. Doctor My Eyes from Glastonbury Festival 2010. You will see a master at work with an instrument and um, makes you want to put the guitar down. Um, and that's Mark Goldenberg, of course. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. 